Um, we're gonna preach on marriage today and I am very excited about it. Now, uh, I, need, I need two volunteers, okay? Hegemans, will y'all come up here real quick? Give it up for the Hegemans, give it up for them, let's go. All right, how uncomfortable is your wife right now? Very uncomfortable. Do y'all wanna go back off stage or do you wanna do this? Okay, he said, let's do it. All right, I want y'all to stand on the twos. See the twos right there? Wow, we got it numbered up here, guys. Numbered and uh, so there's, there's no way that we can mess this up. Okay, so y'all turn towards one another, look at each other lovingly. How long have y'all been married? Three years. Three years, can we give it up for three years? Let's go. Wow, that's incredible and um, that's awesome. So welcome, uh, we're gonna do something a little bit different today, okay? So Noah, I want you just to repeat after me. Go ahead and grab hands. You have to stay on. Yeah. Well, you, can, you don't have to stay on the two. <laughs> that was good, that was good, okay. All right, um, are you ready? Okay, Noah, would you repeat after me? I, Noah. I, Noah. Take you, Macy. To be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward. Whoa. Okay, you got it? Okay, I messed it up too, okay. For, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I promise to love and cherish you. If you do all of that, please say, I do. You just say, I do. I do. Okay, yeah. all right, are you, are you good? Yeah. Okay, so pause for just a second, okay, ready? Um, now, here's the deal, let me ask you a question real quick, Noah. Did you prepare for this and in any way, shape or form know <laughs> that you were going to do this this morning? No. No, okay. Uh, Macy, did you know when you woke up and smelled his breath, morning breath, that this was gonna happen? No, absolutely not. Okay, all right, so y'all go ahead and grab a seat real quick. And uh, here's why I wanted to do that and why I wanted everyone here to see that is because most of us, most of us, when we get down the altar and we get married, we forget that our marriage is more than a wedding day. We forget. In fact, I, I would dare say that many of us, we make a promise on a wedding day that maybe we weren't ready to practice. A promise that we weren't prepared to keep. Now, just like Noah and Macy didn't prepare, many of us, if we're really honest about it, we didn't prepare either. In fact, instead of preparing for the marriage, often we prepare for the wedding. Now, um, this to me feels like a newer phenomenon, but um, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but when people get married these days, they go on 49 and a half bachelorette trips. Have you seen this? It's like Facebook is full of all these bachelorette trips and I don't know if I have 49 and a half friends. And these people are taking groups all over the place and they're going out and they're having all this fun and they're drinking a bunch and they're doing this and that. And the problem is that we forget that three months after the wedding day, you are still married. <laughs> we prep for the wedding, but we often forget or we refuse to prep for the marriage. In fact, I, I, would, I would say that Many of us, we think and we even believe something that goes like this, the, the wedding will be amazing. And I will make this promise to this person. I will make this vow to this person. And I will never, <laughs> I will never quit on this. I'm gonna be with her till death do us part. The wedding is gonna fix all of our problems if I can just make a big enough promise. And some of us, we spend over a year planning for a wedding, planning for a one day event, and we avoid the seven years of bad habits that we've built all along the way. And can I just let you in on a little secret? All of those bad habits you built over those seven years, they are gonna show up the day after your wedding. <laughs> now, here's something you need to know about getting married. When you get married, you are accountable. 
And when you are accountable for something that you're not capable of, it will make you miserable. Let me repeat that. When you are accountable for something, but you're not capable of that thing, of that commitment, of that preparation, of that promise, you will be miserable. Let me explain it this way. Um, You can sign up for a marathon and you can want to run that marathon and you can be excited about that marathon. But if you don't train for the 26.2 miles, it doesn't matter how much you want to do it. It doesn't matter how many promises you made to do it. It doesn't matter because you were not capable of doing it. And I promise you, you will be miserable in those 26.2 miles. Now, even if you did prepare, you're probably gonna be miserable during those 26.2 miles. Single people, if you're single today and like you're not married, you're not looking to get married, you're just living life. I want you to lean in a little bit today because before you get committed to a person, you need to go ahead and commit that you're going to prepare. You're gonna prepare because oftentimes we get into a marriage and we're not capable of living out the promises that we make And we don't know how to get capable. How how do you get capable? You get capable by preparing, preparing. So how do you prepare? How do you prepare for a wedding or better yet, how do you prepare for a marriage? What I would submit to you today, in order to prepare for a marriage, you need to build a love triangle. You need to build a love triangle. Ephesians chapter five and verse 21 is gonna be our scripture today. If you got your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter five and verse 21. It'll also be on the screens as well. It says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. If you want to have the marriage that you always longed for, the marriage you always hoped for, the marriage one day, someday that you always dreamed of, I would dare say today, you can have that marriage with one simple word, not easy to apply, but simple. It's the word submit. If you want to have a marriage that you always hoped for, the marriage you always dreamed of, you have to learn men and women to submit. The healthiest marriages know that submission, by the way, is not a bad word. (laughs) The healthiest marriages know that it is a submission competition that brings people together. It's submission to one another, yes, but it's also, and more importantly, submission to a holy God. Submitting to God's will above your own, knowing that God's will is best, knowing that God knows best. It's submitting to God's ways and submitting to your spouse. Submitting to your spouse by loving them, by sacrificing for them, by respecting them. It is a love triangle. It's a love triangle. It goes like this. If this is a love triangle, and you may have seen this illustration before, at the very tippy top is God. God's at the top. He's at the very top. The husband is on one side and the wife is on the other side. In fact, I I wanna illustrate this this way. Sarah, will you come up here and help me real quick? Um, 
And then will you pick those up for me? Because if I bend over, I will, I will my pants will split. Um, this is the suit that I wore in our wedding nine years ago. And so, uh, yeah, okay. Barely, it's okay. Anyway, so here's the deal. This triangle, okay, has Sarah and I, and, and we are connected here together. And the closer that we each get to God, the closer we each get to one another. Now, the reverse is also true though. It goes both ways. The further that we get away from God, the further we get from one another. And what's interesting about this principle, this love triangle principle is that you cannot, as a husband, you cannot, as a wife, control your spouse. You cannot make, I cannot make my spouse grow closer to Jesus. I cannot scream at her enough. I cannot throw the Bible at her enough. I cannot quote enough scriptures at Sarah to make her grow closer to God. It's her relationship with God and she has to grow it. See, the reality is that your relationship is your relationship. Your relationship with God is your responsibility. Sarah and I, we've gotten a lot of questions in this series asking, what do you do if your spouse isn't trying to get closer to God? Like if you're really trying to get closer to God, but your spouse isn't. The reality is that your relationship with God is your relationship with God. And what we've said time and time again is that you can't control them. All you can do is love them like Jesus. All you can do is pursue Jesus yourself and see what God does on the other side. Thanks, babe. So if you wanna build a love triangle, if you wanna have this dynamic where you are both seeking God more than anything else, you're both going after the Lord, you gotta submit that's not a word that we use very often in our language today. But I would dare say that this is the one thing that can save your marriage or set you up for a future successful marriage. It takes submission. So I'm gonna run through a couple points today. Number one, you've got to learn, I've got to learn to submit to Jesus. Submit to Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter five says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, out of reverence for Jesus. See, the motivation for your submission in marriage, it has got to be Jesus. It's got to be something stronger than the feeling that you have. It's got to be something stronger than the commitment that you have. It's got to be something stronger than both of you liking the University of Tennessee volunteers. Hello, go Vols. It's gotta be something better and bigger. It's gotta be Jesus. And we've talked about it a lot in the last couple of months, but let me just bang it home again. Jesus is king. Jesus is worthy of our submission. Jesus is worthy of our love. Jesus is worthy of our obedience. Jesus alone is worthy. Now, whether you're married or not, Jesus is worthy of your submission. Whether you're married or not. But marriage is, it's an illustration. It's an illustration time and time again throughout the New Testament. Marriage is an illustration of the salvation relationship. In fact, it is used more times in the New Testament as almost anything else to describe, to describe Jesus and the church. Okay, AKA Jesus and you, if you know him. And that illustration of Jesus in the church, it goes, it goes deeper than just, yeah, the wife is like the church and the husband is like Jesus. And it goes deeper than that. It goes far deeper than that. Because on your wedding day, when Noah and Macy were up here and Noah said, I do, on your wedding day, you say, I do. But what you know after the fact is if you want a healthy marriage, you have got to say, I do, day after day after day after day after day. Men, it is constant. It is, I do, daily. I do take out the trash. Hello. 
I do change the oil. I do fill up the tank when she leaves it on zero. (laughs) I do, I do. You got to say I do daily. Now, here's why this illustration of Jesus and the church and man and woman goes deeper than just in name. Because it is a lifelong pursuit saying I do with Jesus. It's saying I do to Jesus every single day. I do even when it's hard to obey. And if you follow Jesus for any significant amount of time, you know it's not always easy. Hello. It's not always easy. Sometimes you would much rather follow your flesh. You would much rather follow what your desires are. But it's saying I do to Jesus daily regardless. Why? Because, let me say it again, Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. He gave up everything for you. He gave up everything for me. He's worthy. Which by the way, this idea of submission to Jesus, um, the, the love triangle, it only works if you're both submitted to Jesus. So let me talk to the single people real quick that are dating somebody that doesn't know Jesus. It might be time, it might be time to break it off with them if they don't follow Jesus. Actually, it's time to break it off with them if they don't follow Jesus. That is a prerequisite for you moving forward if you're a follower of Jesus. You are not a missionary to them. Hello, you are not a missionary on Tinder. You are not a missionary to them. If you wanna be a missionary, go with us to Guatemala next time. You're not a missionary to them. It's what the apostle Paul calls unequally yoked. They're not going in the same direction. They're going in polar opposites. And what's interesting about a love triangle and this principle is that the the more that you follow and obey and say, I do to Jesus, the more you're going to follow and you're going to submit naturally to your spouse, not submitting in ways that are detrimental to you, submitting in ways that are serving to them, that are loving to them, that are sacrificing and giving to them. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Philippians chapter two, he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. The God of creation humbled himself. Do you understand that? He made himself a part of his own creation. In fact, anecdotally, I'd say my marriage, Sarah and I, our relationship is better when I personally am closer to God. We are closer when I'm closer. So the question is, how how do I submit? Okay, how do I submit to Jesus? If I need to submit to Jesus, what does that look like practically? Like, I've not read the Bible. I don't know all the theological ramifications of everything. How do I submit to Jesus? Let me just boil it down the way that Jesus boiled it down in John chapter 13. Jesus gave one big commandment. He said, love one another as I have loved you, you should love one another. So do you wanna submit to Jesus? Do you wanna get closer to God? If you wanna do that, love someone who's far from God. We make it so complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. Love somebody. You wanna get closer to God? All right, you'll get closer to God when you're loving your spouse. You're sacrificing for your spouse. You wanna get closer to God, love your neighbor. What's incredible about marriage that I think we take for granted is that marriage is the visible representation of the invisible relationship that we have with Jesus if you know Jesus. That's why last week we talked about repentance and forgiveness. That great marriages are built on repenting, I'm sorry, and built on forgiveness. Marriage is a relationship 
that we should use in Christian households, we should use to show and tell the world about the forgiveness that we have received in Jesus. I should forgive Sarah, not because I should forgive Sarah, but because I've been forgiven by Jesus. In fact, I would dare say that for some people in your life, the the world might see forgiveness in your relationship before they experience it in their life. They need to see it in our relationships. They need to experience it in our relationships because when you are forgiving them, it's showing that you belong to him. Submit to Jesus. Second, you submit to one another. One another. The problem for a lot of us though is that like we believe that love is this feeling, right? More than a lasting commitment, it's more of a feeling. And if you haven't been here in this whole series, you should go back and watch week one. We talked all about that and we went in on that. You should go check that out. But we have this idea that love is a feeling. Let me illustrate it this way. I, I have three kids and I love my kids and I talk about my kids every single week because they keep giving me content. It's incredible. If you need content, just have kids. And um, I love my kids. I really do. I really do love my kids. I've got three, my oldest son, Cash, he just turned seven on Friday. And um, he is just, he's awesome. This past week we went to um, my parents' house during fall break for a couple days. And my little nephew, he's five and his dad is an Alabama fan. And he is making his son an Alabama fan and leading him down the path of destruction and sin and hate and you know, all the things. And we're trying to save him and bring him to Jesus and Neeland, and um, (laughs) it's not working. But Cash and Coleman, my nephew, they got in a literal fist fight, like they were pushing and fighting because Cash was like, no, it's Tennessee. And I've never been more proud of my son. I just like, (laughs) yeah, that's right, son, that's right. And um, I love him, even when he's doing stuff like that. I love my my second born, Kobe, Um, he is like, all of the stereotypes of a middle child is Kobe. All of them, crazy, wild, insane, a savage, all of them. Example, and I love him. We, we, we took him to the zoo. I don't know when this was, it's been a while now. We went to the Knoxville Zoo and he just pulls his pants down to pee, like on a turtle, just like, <laughs> what are we doing here, bud? And uh, no cares in the world, he's like, yep. Had to go, you know? It's like, all right, better than in your pants, I guess. And, um, and then my, my third daughter, uh, I love her. She's, she's incredible. Not my third daughter. She's my third child. Dear God, please, Jesus, no more. Uh, I don't need a third daughter. I just need a third child. And um, she's awesome and she's perfect and she'll never do anything wrong. So here's, here's the deal though. I, I love my kids, okay? But I want you to imagine with me that my kids do something crazy and they make me upset. They get on my nerves, you know, something like that. Kobe pees in my shoes, you know, uh, which he did that at our party one time. He peed in another girl's shoes. And I was like, bro, that's not how you get the girls. <laughs> like, um, but he did it. And um, imagine he does something crazy and I get so mad and I'm finally, I'm finally done with him. And I just go to Kobe and I say, Kobe, you know, it's just... It's just not working out. Um, Let's just, you know what? Let's just go our separate ways and I'll let you take the house. I'll keep the Jeep. Don't worry, Kobe, it's not you, it's me. (laughs) Like you would never do that to your kid. If you have kids, you know, you would never do that to your kid. Why? Because you love them. And you view that love, watch this, as a commitment. And for some of us, it's easier to view that love with your child as a commitment than it is to view that with your spouse. But did you know it's not just a commitment with your spouse, it's actually a covenant with God. 
It's not just because you feel love. It's not just because she's, she looks good. It's not just because he makes good money. No, no, no. It's a covenant with God. Matthew chapter 16 says this, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's Jesus. That's the red letters. Jesus says, let no one separate. God is involved in marriage. God is involved. It's why it should be the priority relationship in your life, not your kids. God is involved between you and your spouse. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. And if you're married today, submitting to one another is how you show the world that you are submitted first and foremost to God. Jesus' command to love one another. It is teased out. It's applied by the Apostle Paul and James and John and Peter in the New Testament. There are over 59 other one another's in the letters of the New Testament. And all of them are application of the one big command by Jesus to love one another. Okay, Jesus, well, we love each other, but how do we do that? And the apostle Paul and John and James and Peter, they come in under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they tell us how to love one another. And they say to serve one another and be generous to one another and practice hospitality toward one another and honor one another and encourage one another and to lift up one another and to pray Pray for one another. The, the mark of submission in your marriage is love. The mark of love in your marriage is one anothering one another. It's dying to self. It's saying not my will, not my preferences, but first God's, and then I'm gonna submit and serve and love and sacrifice for my spouse. I'm gonna do that for my, my spouse. Now, the Apostle Paul is very, very specific when it comes to how we are to submit to our spouses. So many times, I think, not with bad intentions, but so many times in churches, um, we have looked at wives submit to your husband and we have forgotten verse 21 that says, submit one to another. But, but the Apostle Paul also has some very specific commands for men today and for women today. For men, he says, how to submit. How do you submit? You submit through love and sacrifice. So if you're a husband today, lean in a little bit. If you're a wife and your husband's not here, write it down and then hand him the note card. Love and sacrifice. Paul specifically calls men to love their spouse, watch this, to the point of death. Can I just remind you when he says that you should love in the same way that Jesus loved the church, can I remind you that Jesus loved the church to death, to death on the cross? (laughs) Love your wife to death, laying down your life for her, protecting her. Men, let me just ask you, are you willing? Are you willing not just to die for her, are you willing to die to self for her? Are you willing to die to your desires, to die to your sin, to die to your past? And it's not just physical, by the way. It's not just physical death. Men are are called to protect our wives, to protect them not just physically, but spiritually and mentally and emotionally. Are you willing to lay down your life, men? Are you willing to lay down your life so that she can live? Your side of the submission coin, you both submit one to another, mutual submission. But your side is to love her to death, to die to yourself. Now, the flip side of the coin For the ladies, for the wives here, how do you submit is respect and honor. Respect and honor. Paul specifically requests that women respect their husbands and honor their husbands. And um, let me just, again, let me talk to men again because I also am a man and um, it's easier to talk to the men. And I just, 
Sometimes I think that men just need to be called out a little bit and kind of wake up a little bit. Can I get an amen from the women? Okay. And the, the husband that's sitting next to her is like, oh, okay, thanks. Um, now, men, um, I know this section is for the ladies. All right, I get it. But listen to me. If you will love her to death, I promise it'll be so much easier for her to respect and honor and submit to you. If you will love her and sacrifice for her in the ways that you should. I'm talking about dying to yourself, men. I'm talking about giving of yourself to her. I'm talking about loving her in the way she deserves to be loved. She will have no problem with following your lead. The problem for so many of us is we have men that are demanding respect, but they don't love. Demanding honor, but they're not worthy of honor. Guys, we we have got to love our spouses to death. Love our wives to death. Let me close with this as we get ready to transition in just a minute. Let me close by reminding you of a couple of intentions because it's very important that we understand and we remember that the enemy has an intention for your marriage. Satan has an intention for your marriage. The intention of the enemy is to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy in your life and whether you're married or not today. His intention is to steal, kill, and destroy everything in your life. He doesn't like you to succeed. He doesn't like you to do well. He definitely doesn't like when your marriage is doing well. He doesn't like when you're following Jesus. He definitely doesn't like when you're following God and you're getting closer to God. Satan hates it. Satan hates marriage. He hates it. He hates a marriage when it's healthy because it is the perfect picture of Jesus and the church. And there's a few things that Satan really hates. Satan hates Jesus and Satan hates the church. And when your marriage is looking the way it should with sacrifice and respect and mutual submission, Satan hates it. He wants to divide and conquer He wants to destroy it from the inside out. He wants to break it down to the ground. He wants to destroy it. He wants to break this triangle of man, woman, and God, this love triangle. He wants to break it by any means necessary. And can I fill you in on a little uh, little info is that he can't break your relationship with God. That's good news. That's good news. Anyone who is in the hand of the Father cannot be plucked out. The enemy cannot take you from the salvation that you've received through Jesus. That's good news. He can't take you from it. It's by the grace of God. So there's nothing that you could do not to earn it. There's nothing you could do to earn it. There's nothing you could do to lose it. And there sure ain't nothing that the enemy and all his demons in hell could do to take it from you. That's good news. But what he can do is he can wiggle his ugly self into the middle of the relationships and he can try to break you apart. He can't break you from God, but he can break you from her. And he will do it by any means necessary. He wants to steal and kill and destroy. And he wants to start with something small and it's a little compromise here and it's a little compromise there and it's a little text here and it's a little flirt over there. And he wants to fit in any way he can to break you apart. He hates marriage. But can I give you some good news today because God has an intention as well. God's intention, if you're married or if you're preparing for marriage or you hope to be married one day, The intention of God is to be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And it's not just having kids. (laughs) It's not just having more little caches and Kobe's running around. This spreads across the board. 
It's being fruitful in every area of your life. It's working together. It's serving together. It's loving one another. It's one anothering one another. What are those things? It's encouraging. It's lifting up. It's challenging. It's being generous toward. It's giving grace to. It's praying for. Those are the things that God wants in your marriage. That's his intention. He wants your marriage to reflect his relationship with you. Unconditional love, unconditional grace, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And here's the reality, is that the closer that you get to Jesus, the closer you and your spouse get to one another, the more you're able to show the world, tell the world what Jesus has done for you personally. 